Very good. Well, thanks, Bastian, for, for being here. And uh, thank you all for joining our uh, installment of the I Can't Believe It's Not Better monthly seminar series, um, which uh, has been off for uh, a month or two. So now we're happy to start with full speed uh, and momentum into the summer season. And we have a few cool speakers lined up for the next um, month also. So definitely make sure to sign up to our mailing list and watch the website. Um, and so we start this exciting season of talks with um, Bastian Rick today, who's going to tell us what's in a graph. Um, so Bastian is a PI at uh, Helmholtz and TU Munich. And uh, he's leading the IDOS lab, which is uh, very aptly named, I find. Um, and he's focusing on topology and um, geometry and, and graphs and all these kind of things um, with a particular interest in biomedical applications. Um, he's also a member of Ellis, and he was previously at ETH Zurich and uh, University of Heidelberg where he did his PhD in maths and then uh, did a postdoc with, um, with Carsten Borgwald at the biosystem science um, department. Um, so with that, I'd like to give you a warm welcome again, Bastian, and uh, please take it away and tell us what's in a graph. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much um, for the kind invitation. It's really amazing to, to uh, yeah, give a talk here and then be part of this exciting seminar series because I think the the goals are really the the right goals here, right? Looking at why things don't work and what we can do as a community to improve that. And this should also be the spirit of my talk. So I'm trying to give you rather a, I should almost say, philosophical perspective on the field of graph learning as such. And I won't be outlining now tons of new methods or something like this, but I'd rather want to want to take a more deeper look at the at our core protagonist at the at the graph itself. And I try to, to make this fun. Uh, it's my kind of fun. I hope it's your kind of fun as well. We'll, we'll see that. So you'll see some quotes and things that are peppered in there. And I just want to say in the beginning that, of course, this is just my opinion here, right? It's, it's not, there's no objective truth necessarily to, to everything that I'm saying, but I would love to get in contact with you if you're interested in this field and if you're interested in moving it forward and if you find some some objective things if you find something if you object to anything that i say then i would love to get in contact with you because i think that's that's a great way to start this course with that being said the title of this of this uh, talk is what's in a graph and this is of course uh, shamelessly stolen from from shakespeare the great play of romeo and juliet which spoiler alert uh, two kids love each other and then uh, everything falls apart unfortunately but there's this great saying, what's in a name, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And in the graph learning context, if we didn't have William Shakespeare, but maybe some kind of uh, Shakespearean researcher from DeepMind or from, from ETH or from somewhere else, maybe they would say, what's in a graph, that which we call our data by any other means would train as well. And I think this is the sentiment that should continue and follow us throughout this talk. And by the way, if you object to anything really strongly, or if you have some thoughts or some questions about that, then please feel feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, we can also have a discussion afterwards. So I'm I'm fine with both of them. Now let's start. So what is actually a graph? Well, you can I can give you the normal mathematical definition: a tuple VE. You have a set of vertices, a set of edges, and the set of edges is of course consisting of subsets of paired vertices. Nothing new there. You can order these vertices, uh, these edges as well, of course. Then you have an then you have a directed graph, so that that already changes things. And typically, you visualize graphs by just drawing them somewhere in the plane. But there's already kind of a lot of assumptions in that because there is no inherent visualization that is right for the graph, uh, unless you have really coordinates attached to that. But we'll get to this later in the talk, of course. So all of these are. I should say, mere shadows that, that help us make sense of the graph or sense of the topic, but this they might not actually model reality. Now, there's some alternative views on graphs which are just as right. Namely, you could say a graph is actually a triangulation of some manifold, right? You could say we have, a, we have an underlying manifold, we triangulate this, and bam, we get a graph. You could also say, if you're more inclined in, to go in the algebraic topology direction, you could say a graph is a one-dimensional simplicial complex. Or you could even say that, no, no, a graph is actually a metric space. 
So all of these are valid views, or you could be very hardcore or very category theory-like, and you could say, no, no, a graph is actually a set system. Now, this, this just demonstrates that we have multiple ways of viewing this, uh, this, this type of modality, and it's up to us to decide a little bit which of these uh, paradigms to use and, and, and what, they, uh, what, what they mean in practice. And to illustrate this a little bit, by the way, the slides that have these crossed swords uh, there, they are a little bit a warning for you that what comes here is, is something that might be controversial, or but that it's definitely just my opinion. I mean, not, I'm not borrowing this from somewhere. So again, if you object to this or if you like it, then just let me know. So there are a collection of different attitudes, I should say, where these graphs are coming from. We have seen that they can be viewed as different things, as different objects. But where do actually where, where do they actually come from? And in best Dungeons and Dragons uh, manner, I should say there's different. Uh, there's at least uh, three different alignments. There's the lawful one, which could be a very strong mathematician who says graphs occur only in graph theory. Anything else is not a graph. Then there could be the neutral one, which I particularly like. I have to admit, graphs can arise from other data modalities as well. And then you could have the maybe chaotic one, which says everything is a graph. Right. And as an as an example of this, I'm not making this up. People have these attitudes. They just don't give them these nice alignments. Right. So the House of Graphs, for instance, which is a database for mathematicians working in graph theory, they actually state that most graph theorists will agree that among the vast number of graphs that exist, there are only a few thousand that can be considered really interesting. So I would say on behalf of the graph learning community, thank you very much for this. Just give us these uh, few interesting graphs and then we, we call it a day and we have finished the field, right? Of course, it's not that easy. What I meant to say with this slide is that it depends a little bit on where we believe our data arises from in the end. And this changes also the way that we deal with this data and that we develop algorithms for this type of data. Now, that being said, I'm following this neutral paradigm, so graphs can arise from other data modalities. So let's take a look at what these modalities might be. So for instance, a very nice way of obtaining graphs from point clouds is you take this point cloud on the left-hand side, you pick a distance threshold, epsilon, and you just start connecting things that are less than or equal to epsilon in terms of that metric. That is sometimes known as a neighborhood graph, a radius graph, or as a RIPS graph um, at scale epsilon. Now, if you do this, I have no objections, right? This is, this is not wrong to do, not as such. But if you do this, you should be aware of this, and you should be aware of the fact that you turned your point cloud into a graph by choosing a specific parameter. So in some sense, in some sense you performed some modeling operation, and you should be aware of this type of modeling operation that you do. Likewise, moving on to another modality, you can turn a time series into a graph. So it's time series on the left-hand side, just a couple of points. It's a very nice signal, right? You have, you have high parts, you have, you have peaks, you have valleys, and so on. You can turn this into a, into a graph by looking at the visibility of individual points. So basically, you connect points if they have an unobstructed side within the time series to any other point. And then you obtain some guy like this. This uh, little fellow here is called the visibility graph. Um, it's actually part of a bigger construction or a bigger framework of constructing these types of graphs. There's not just this single type of construction for these uh, type of data available, but also a couple of other um, a, a couple of other parameters work out. But essentially, you connect observations if no other observations occur along the linear interpolation. This is also not objectively wrong or right to do. It's just one way to model the time series data, and in some cases and some applications it might be really useful to do. There's a great paper that introduced this beforehand. This is by La Casa and colleagues from 2008 from time series to complex networks, the visibility graph. And they essentially show that you have different regimes of, of chaotic behavior, non-chaotic behavior, and that the graphs that arise from this can be can be different. So in some sense, the graphs are a proxy, are a shadow of the of the overarching time series that is being used. Again, you can do this. This is great. But how do these graphs actually differ from the little fellow that I showed you at the beginning? Uh, at, at the beginning, so it's just this simple connection, this couple of nodes and and lines in the plane. Well, we need to make sure that that we understand this. There are indeed some graphs that arise from some prior geometry or from some topology, if you will, namely from these time series or from these manifolds, from these point clouds, and so on. And 
the attributes or anything that we put into this graph, including and in particular the edges themselves, they reflect this geometry to a certain extent. So they are an instance, they are a, a proxy of the, of the underlying geometry. And so when studying these types of graphs, and that's actually a good thing, we are actually studying this, this geometry. Again, this is really good. This gives us a lot of intuition and this gives us a lot of insights into different geometries, but we should be aware of this. So again, if you know Shakespeare, this might be this might seem familiar. So some graphs are born geometrical, some achieve geometry and upon them by us when we model them. Again, you can do this. There's no right or wrong here, but you need to be aware of this. And now one point that I want to raise or a couple of claims that I want to make. About this community are equipped to ask what it actually means because we are lumping on some other things and from the pure platonic realm of mathematics, we are lumping them all together in our in our benchmarks and in our papers. Again, it's not to say that we can't do this, right? But we are not equipped to ask what this actually means, so what we are actually studying as an object. And I think scientifically speaking, this is a little bit problematic. So what I think we should do is we need to develop some kind of better language for describing graph data. So I'm not saying that we don't have a language for this. I'm saying we need to develop a somewhat better language for describing those. So not only describing them in terms of um, average number of nodes, average number of edges, diameter, and so on, but really also describing the data that gave rise to this graph. And here's a controversial thought from me. I think that by treating all these graphs the same in, in the in the philosophical sense, right? Not, not of course, with our data sets. Sometimes we have, uh, we have labels. Sometimes we don't, right? But by by not thinking about these things, we are making a mistake. We are at least leaving out a couple of things. So we need to we need to think a little bit more. We think we need to think a little bit more deeply about what it means to study specific type of graphs. Now that brings me to a brief case study, which which I hope fits very nicely into the topic of this seminar, because we, I think, during the development of these methods, we said a couple of times, I can't believe it's not better. And so uh, this is, uh, this, this fits very nicely into this, into this grander scheme of things, though. So the case study is um, posed as a, as a question, namely, does knowing something about the topology actually help in graph learning? And here's our motivation for this. So everything starts with a hypothesis when we're doing when we're doing these sorts of projects, right? So we were thinking, well, graphs can be seen as topological objects, so they have some kind of connectivity. So we can we can make sense of that, we can understand that, we can characterize that. So not all graph learning algorithms are necessarily aware of all the topological features. There's great work going on by by lots of people. I have a couple of those later on in the talk that are looking at substructures, at expressivity, at what types of problem you can solve with uh, graph neural networks, and so on and so forth. But a priori, and at the time when we were undertaking this type of endeavor, there was not a lot known about this. So there, we we didn't really know what 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 graph learning could do or what graph neural networks could do. So what we thought is making models aware of such features, so aware of some connectivity of connected components of cycles and these sort of things, this should be bound to improve predictive performance, right? Because probably there's something in the data that we can leverage. And if our method is the only one that can leverage that, then we would expect that we would see more. And as I already said, I can't believe it's not better. So we started this out with a, with a very nice um, procedure, I think it's, it's um, called a persistent WL procedure for graph classification. And without going too much into details, the idea was here that we make this venerable subtree kernel algorithm aware of connected components and cycles. So we give it some kind of additional capabilities, but we stick with its original definition. And then we see what happens with, with the predictive performance on our benchmark data sets. This was actually useful because we could show that is the part of the juicy mathematics that I tend to like. We could show that the known algorithm, so, so the stuff that was already described in literature, we were able to show that this is actually a specific instance of a larger scheme of things in the data. That's great. We could also, and that is something that I really want to underscore here, that I can give this as an as an advice um, from, from someone who's been doing this for a while to, to those of you that are just starting out in the field, 
we were able to build intuition based on quick iterative development. That's really, really useful. Having small test cases, having small data sets where you can just throw your methods on them. You can see what happens. If you get a signal there, that's good. That should give you hope for, for having a stronger signal on the bigger data sets. If you don't get a signal there, maybe you should reconsider the approach and you, you should think about, okay, what is actually um, going on here? But by being able to do this quickly and not having to wait for a couple of days for the results, that really helped in method development. And indeed, when we looked at some of the smaller data sets, you, you can read these tables because you're aware of the, and familiar with the machine learning literature, right? So you're looking for the bold table cells. And of course, the, the bold cells are the ones that, that our methods can do. Again, not so much, uh, this is not so much about the details here, but for instance, with a very small data set, uh, MuTag, we were able to increase the performance in contrast to the to the baseline performance we were able to increase that um, considerably and, the, and and this worked just because it was able to detect cycles in the data so that gave us gave us some hope and as i said it was a nice project for this and so we tried to to continue with this with this line of reasoning with this line of research and we wanted to make graph neural networks now aware of these type of of information so not just by augmenting uh, node attributes or node features, but really by having a kind of differentiable topological information in the graph neural network. The way we did this is we provided a new layer that we could use for hot swapping, basically, in a graph neural network if we wanted to. So replace with our layer, or well, one layer we could replace one layer with, with our layer, I should say. Uh, to again, to test this, we in the spirit of iterating quickly, we created new synthetic data sets that have pronounced topological features, and we use those to figure out what is going on, whether our method can actually do something with this. We found high predictive performance on these data sets, which is good, right? This is how it should be. Otherwise, we would be doing something wrong. I mean, the data sets were chosen for this purpose, or they were developed for this purpose. But we unfortunately got mediocre performance on other benchmark data sets. Now, this was a little bit sobering, of course, because we thought that we were really onto something there. We couldn't believe that this wouldn't be, that this would not, would not work, right? And in fact, this essentially forced us to, to describe it as this. We said on data sets with pronounced topolo topological structures, we found that our method helps obtain, uh, GNNs obtain substantial gains in predictive performance. Which is true because we ran an ablation study that that looked at um, the same benchmark data sets, but with um, random node features, and this turned out to make to make a difference here. So we got better performance if we randomized the node features. So if we just focused on the overall topological structure, in in some sense, retrospectively, this this might be clear. You could say, "Wow, well, well, of course, if you're removing some kind of information, then of course your method is better." But we were really astonished at the time and a little bit horrified because we thought that wait we are giving some orthogonal information into the into the network here and why does it why does it not work well the we have now come to the conclusion that it doesn't work because a lot of the information about some of these graphs at least is already contained in the node features so essentially the topology of the graph or the edge information might not even be that useful and that is a very hard and sobering truth i would say because it essentially means that we wouldn't have to deal with the graph in the first place, right? We could just be dealing with just the nodes and so on. And this, this kind of finding, this kind of observation, this will continue with us. This will follow us through the rest of the talk because I think this is also an important thing that people should be aware of and that people should be doing more. So we are forced to summarize this, this question as the, uh, by, by, by answering it with, it depends. So does topology have in graph learning? Well, the answer is, it depends. For some data sets, it makes a big difference. For other data sets, depending on what is already in the node features or in the edge features, it really doesn't make a big difference at all. Which again is unfortunate if you if you come from purist point of view and you're saying that here we have something that is currently not captured in the literature and now we can capture it, but you but it turns out that it that it's not that important in the first place and. I believe that this points towards an underlying principle that, that I'm going to, to outline later on in this talk, namely that we sometimes don't really formalize the way we create these data sets and what is actually in these graph data sets. And I think this is an important thing to realize and an important thing to moreover rectify later on. So 
couple of lessons learned with this. One of the lessons, and I really want to emphasize this here, so I'm glad that I get this platform, is please make your baseline as strong as possible. Or even plural, make your baselines, right, as strong as possible. Because that tells you whether you're onto something. You need... You need to make sure that you're not fooling yourself because I think I think it was Feynman who said that we are the 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 easiest person to fool, right? So make sure that you're that you're really onto something. Train your competitor methods the the best way you can. Train them early, train them often. Don't just train them once and say, okay, this is what we're what we're what we are using, but rather train them continuously throughout the method development process because you want to make sure that you're telling the right thing that you're telling the truth about the signal in the data and you don't want to inadvertently fool yourselves. The other thing, of course, is it really paid off for us to iterate quickly to check the hypothesis. So if we hadn't done these small iteration data sets where we had a known topological structures in there, we might have already given up in the, in the first place and we might just have said, okay, well, obviously this doesn't work, so let's move on to something else. But having these well-defined and well-understood and interpretable data sets, interpretable in a, in a general sense here, right? We were able to understand and, and, and check that our hypotheses were not completely off, but that the problem was in some sense in the data and not in the world, because that's good. We can fix the data, probably can't fix the whole world. Now, brings me to another point, ablation studies in this type of thing. So not only for graph learning, but of course, especially in graph learning, if you're doing something new, if you're proposing a new layer, a new mechanism and so on, these ablation studies are also crucial. So in our case, we filled dozens of pages in the appendix, of course, with additional ablations where we looked at, does it change? Um, does it make a difference where we put our layers? Does it make a difference? How, how deep we go into the graph and so on and so forth. And this is really, really helpful, not only for reviewers who, who tend to demand these things um, quite often because it's because it's a, a very easy thing to demand, right? That, but that opens up a, a whole other can of worms that I that I want to <laughs> that I want to keep close for for today. But it also helps you understand what is going on in the method because you can you can see you can disentangle some of the factors, you can disentangle some of the parameters of your data, and you can figure out what is then going on. So, the other thing that I wanted to mention, maybe not super relevant. Um, to check your hypothesis, right? You should make sure that you use repeated nested cross validation for those. So there's a great, um, there's a great quote from that 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 Leslie wrote in in our paper on filtration curves. Um, for example, our previous work had high results as high as 80% on IMDb binary, another one of these graph benchmark datasets, when considering just a single run of tenfold cross validation. However, the results were not reflective of performance when repeated ten times which reduced performance to around 73%. So that is also in line with saying, make your baseline as strong as possible and ensure that you are not fooling yourself. So some people have this magical thinking that cross-validation fixes everything. And in fact, there are quite a few blog posts out there, unfortunately, that tell you, yeah, just do cross-validation, then it will work. But no, no, there is no magic trick. There is no free lunch in machine learning, in graph learning, and also probably not in the real world. Um, so make sure that that you use strong baselines and that you do a statistically sound analysis in isn't particular when you're dealing with um with smaller data sets and imdb is is a relatively big one still it has a couple of thousands of graphs i think so even there it makes makes a lot of difference in especially when you're using when you're using off the shelf methods for testing something so with that i want to move on to a section where i want to outline a few troubling trends that I'm seeing in the field and hopefully also outline a couple of things about how to how to fix them. So one thing that is really concerning to me is the baselines that exist and the lack of baselines that are sometimes reported in literature. So we have a we have this very big survey on graph kernel state of the art and future challenges and what we did here is like Graph kernels are a little bit old school, I know this, but we analyzed the performance of graph kernels on benchmark data sets. And we also compared them to other things. But um, what we found is that histogram kernels, so kernels that do not really account for the graph structure, but just use uh, vertices, vertex labels, or, or, or edge labels, right? They turn out to be surprisingly effective. This is great, 
but it's not super great when you consider that they are not using any deeper insights into the graph structure here. So there's a very big table. In fact, there's a couple of big tables in that paper. So please, please check it out if you're interested in this. There, um, this is just an, a small excerpt of this, but you can already see that there are a couple of data sets like this AIDS data set where you can get close to perfect uh, predictive performance, close to perfect accuracy. There's also other data sets like this um, aforementioned IMDB binary or some of the proteins data sets like DD or even something like a social network data set with Reddit binary where you can up get almost, let's say, 79% with an edge histogram kernel. Again, I mean, this edge histogram kernel, it at least uses all the edges that are in there, but it doesn't really make use of the graph structure as such. So it doesn't know how these edges are being connected. It's just literally counting something. But such baselines are often absent and I'm not not pointing fingers at, at anyone else but but me here because I mean prior to understanding this this problem a little bit more deeply they were also absent in, in in our work but this just goes to show that we really need to understand the the structure of these graphs and we really need to understand what we can actually uh, gain from them because if your gain when you actually have a G and N and you gain 0.5 percentage points on a data set as opposed to a vertex histogram kernel, then I think we, we are doing something wrong. And then I think we have a problem because we are pitching a method that doesn't really help uh, but give us additional insights into the graph. Now, there is a, to, to continue this trend with the baselines, there's also a great paper by Chen Kai and Yusu Wang um, on a simple yet effective baseline for non-attributed graph classification. And the findings in there are also um, quite horrific in, in the literal sense. So they use a local degree profile to classify graphs. So basically you just take the degrees and maybe the degrees of the neighbors and that's that. And then you train an S SVM on the resulting features. And that's all well and good, right? The features turn out to be surprisingly effective for some of the data sets. That's really interesting. But again, they're also not using any deeper insights into the graph structure here. So the way the author summarized this very succinctly, I should say, is that they say most graph kernels, so again, we're not dealing with graph neural networks, but there's also a couple of comparisons with GNNs in there. Most graph kernels aim to capture graph topology and graph similarity in the hope of improving classification accuracy. Our experiments suggest that this is not yet well reflected on current benchmark data sets for non-attributed graphs. So this points towards one of these troubling trends, namely that we need to understand what we can actually do with our benchmarks and what we what we can't do. So the quote continues a little bit later. In general, while not addressed in this paper, we note that understanding the power and limitations of various graph representations is crucial and remains largely open. So there you have it. This is maybe a call to arms for you if you want to focus your energies on this. I would definitely welcome this. Um, not only in my capacity as a researcher, but also in my capacity as someone that is helping the organizers uh, for the Learning on Graphs conference, right? We want to learn something about graphs and we also want to learn something about the field. But you can see that there are some limitations to, to our knowledge and, and vast amounts of, of in, in the sea of, of ignorance that we still have to cover. Now, another thing that I find very interesting, and, and I guess this view is also somewhat controversial, is that um, by the way, there's nothing controversial about these papers. There's just something controversial about my interpretation of this. Namely, oftentimes I ask myself whether the graph we're looking at is actually the right graph. Because, for instance, uh, Gus Steiger and um, colleagues, they're looking at diff whether diffusion improves graph learning, and they say edges in real graphs are often noisy or defined using an arbitrary threshold, so we can clearly improve upon this approach. Thinking about this arbitrary th uh, threshold, thinking back to how I showed you how to convert a point cloud into a graph, maybe that should ring a bell, right? So there you can already see it. There are modeling decisions and these are not necessarily re reflected in the data sets themselves. And so people have to kind of rectify these, these issues then later on. There's also a great paper by Topping and colleagues on understanding and over squashing, um, um, understanding over squashing and bottlenecks on graph via curvature. And they're saying more recently, there is a trend to decouple the input graph from the graph used for information propagation. And the controversial question I want to raise here is that, is the graph structure that we're dealing with here really, is it maybe not necessary? Could we equally well solve everything with a properly regularized transformer-like architecture? I think that's one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves, in particular, if our graphs are arising from some underlying geometry and the edges are basically, as Garsteiger and colleagues say, um, they are just noisy or defined using an arbitrary threshold, right? Then maybe it's time for us to rethink 
this graph and this, uh, this type of, of modeling. Now, let's take a closer look at our data. These are not troubling trends. These are just things where I think we can, we can improve. This is just pointing out the state of the art, let's see. So is a great, another great paper by um, Palovich and colleagues is that our data sets might not actually be representative of the full scope of, of graphs. So again, coming up with Shakespeare here, right? There is a great uh, quote by Hamlet. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinity space, of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. So basically, like this poor guy in the Flammarion woodcut, you don't really know which type of reality you're escaping to if you have no understanding or no model of this reality. And to quote from the Graph World paper, um, our first finding is that standard benchmark graphs cover only a small region of this graph space that graph world is able to cover via synthetic graph generation. Again, this points towards a very interesting thing for moving forward, namely maybe we are just focusing on the wrong type of graph. So maybe we're just focusing on a very small corner in graph space and are optimizing very heavily for this instead of trying to be broad, trying to be as general and generic as possible. And this indeed is also tied to my, to my previous issue that I raised in the very beginning, namely, we don't have a language to talk about these things. We don't really know how to express this graph is conceptually somehow different from this other graph. We can do it in certain cases, right? We can say, oh, well, this graph arose from a point out, but this graph didn't, but we're not following up on this necessarily. Now, where do our data sets actually come from, right? That's, that's maybe the question. And here, switching gears a little bit, Lord of the Rings, right? Some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend, legend became myth, in the way I would continue. And even myth was long forgotten when some poor fellow like me tried to write a machine learning paper and used a data set for that. And indeed, we often, often we don't have provenance information of our data sets. Not only the graph benchmark data sets, but also the graph benchmark data sets, right? By provenance, I mean, I would like to understand who collected this and for what purpose and what, what was the raw data that was being used and so on. We're going to see a couple of examples why this might matter. There's also, and this is a little bit more disconcerting as someone who loves uh, Git or version control quite a bit, I would say there is typically also no version information in the data. So basically the graphs are being generated by some nice people. The graphs are being put somewhere on the internet. We're, we're going to see where they're being put next. And we don't have version information attached to that. So if, if someone finds out, oh, wait, I made a mistake, then you don't really know how to, how to rectify this. There's also, that's a little bit of a technical issue, there's also oftentimes no predefined splits on the graph. So this is why you have to come up with your own splits. And then it might depend a little bit on whether you have a good split or not, or you have to do this nested cross-validation or whatever. But these, these things are important. We, we need to talk about them. We need to discuss them. So... Let me give you an example because I rather want to point a finger towards me than, than to other people, right? This, this would be unfair because they can't react to this talk. So why is prominence information actually important? And there's a funny uh, little paper that we, that we wrote uh, last year. It's All the World's a Hypergraph. It's a data drama. Try to read it. This was the most fun I ever had when writing a paper because uh, it talks about Shakespeare. And so, of course, it has to be written as a theatrical play. Um, I got a lot of a lot of pushback from this from from some of my colleagues. They were basically saying, "Oh, it's nice that Helmholtz pays you to write poems," but I'm saying, "No, no, it's not poems. It's it's a play." But anyway, um, what we did here and what we what what I'm going to show you next is I'm going to show you three valid co-occurrence networks of characters in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So Romeo and Juliet, again, brief summary. There's these two families, the, the Capulets and the Montagues. They're fighting each other, but Romeo and Juliet, the children of the respective patriarchs, they uh, love each other and they want to want to get together. And this is the a visualization of the their whole co-occurrence. So co-occurrence network is supposed to model the well co-occurrence of characters in a play or in a in a citation graph or in a book or in something like this. There are quite a few co-occurrence networks out there that people are analyzing. And here we highlighted uh, the characters in Act Three, Scene V, where they're a little bit discussing how how the how their love is 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 to be is to continue. Um, the first model, and we don't have to go into the details here, but the first model is just basically unweighted, and you just extract that, and you see whether they are part of the same uh, of the same scene at some point. And in, then you just get this very nice um, useless visualization in some sense because everyone is connected to everyone else. Okay, fair enough. You can 
attach additional weights to that depending on how much time they actually spend on stage. Then you get this graph here in the middle, or you can go even further and you can also weight this accordingly and normalize it by the by the number of, of, of words they might exchange in a scene. So the point that I wanted to make with this is that none of these graphs is a priori better than any of the others, right? They are model decisions. And the persons, in this case us, who present these data sets, who present these graphs, they call the shots. So we decide by, by modeling this, what is actually in there and, and what you can see and what types of information you can see. And now to explain this highlighting. So um, there's one observation, which you probably can't know, because I mean, we, we read the plays and so on. But um, so Romeo and the Capulets themselves, they almost never interact directly. But if you look at the nodes in this graph here, so for instance, here you have a big, uh, big edge from Romeo to Capulet, and here you have another edge from Romeo to Capulet, which also seems to be relatively strong, almost as strong as the edge from Romeo to Benvolio, one of his friends, right? They... Nevertheless, Romeo and the Capulets, if you read the play, they almost never interact directly. They're almost never at the stage, um, on, on the stage at the same time. So any modeling decision that we're doing here, the, it kind of introduces new information. And again, I want to raise the point, there's no right way or wrong way of doing this, but we should be aware of this. So if I would just give you, let's say, the middle version of the data, and I would just claim that this is how Shakespeare's plays would look, then you would analyze Shakespeare's plays with, with your graph neural network, and you would say, okay, this is what I get out of there. But the information you get out of there, the knowledge you extract is contingent on my modeling choices, which you are not aware of. So this, I think, is a problem, and this is why we need provenance information for our data sets. So there's also a couple of other ways. This is what we illustrate in this paper of, of modeling these things. So we came up with hypergraphs, and in hypergraphs, you, you can have more than, than two nodes in an edge. So we were able to model individual scenes uh, as, as hypergraphs, and then you get a way better overview, at least for this specific question, of how the characters interact on stage. So for instance, you can see that Romeo and Juliet are interacting quite a lot, as you would guess in, in this scene here, but that Capulet is not directly interacting with um, with Romeo here. And again, I'm not saying that this is the better visualization, but it is, it is a better way of modeling a specific thing if you're interested in this, and you should at least be aware of the things you're missing when you when you model things in a specific way, when you use a data set from a benchmark repository. So that being said, where do our data sets then actually come from in practice? So what can we say about the prominence, what we can find out? And here I wanna be very, very, um, very strict and, and very honest at the moment um, for, for, well, um, I have one disclaimer to make, namely this is about PyTorch geometric, but please don't construe this as criticism for the PyTorch Geometric team. This is not me saying, oh, they, they, they did everything wrong. No, 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 no. This is pointing out something that, that is a great framework that is being used by lots of people. And this is why I used it for this type of analysis, because that way you can, you can see the, the stuff that is going on there. Um, and what I want to do with this, with this type of analysis on the next couple of slides is, I want to say that we as a community should do more to support these endeavors. So. The next thing that, that I'm going to do after this talk, unless I get tons of hate mail for this and people tell me, no, this is not really a problem. Um, I'm of course trying to, we'll, we'll reach out to them and we'll see how we can rectify this. Maybe we can rectify it together. I'm pretty sure we can. So what I did here is I, I grabbed the, the source code for some uh, notions of, of, of using an URL to download a data set. So the, the code of the of PyTorch Geometric is really great, and it uses the same structure for representing data sets. So that makes grabbing for, for, for specific Python expressions kind of easy to do. Um, and I just took a look at some of the hosts that we, that we found with these URLs and where they're getting the data from. There's a couple of um, interesting findings there. So we have ucl.ac.uk, we have some UniTubingen uh, factors, but we also have a couple of Google Docs, Google Drive, and Dropbox URLs that are in this source code that where the data sets are coming from. So they are probably not put there by the PyTorch geometric developers. And indeed, um, some of the additional data sets can actually be accessed via GitHub repositories. So I was able to look at the owners of these repositories and was able to see those. So 
um, here they are sorted by 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 an alphabetical order. There's quite a uh, quite a few people, quite a few repositories that contribute to this, and this is actually great. I mean, this is how how it should work in a community effort, right? At the same time, there's also some issues with this because, at least to my understanding, there's currently no versioning or fingerprinting mechanism in in place. So basically, the data set is being downloaded from this URL, is extracted to the user's folder, and then it's being trained which means that if you update something or if you delete something, you lose that information potentially. So if any of these repositories is deleted, either by choice or by, by accident, the data set might not be available anymore. But also it could happen that some files are being changed in these repositories. So maybe people are saying, maybe one of these users is saying, oh wait, I actually made a mistake. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch out. I'm gonna exchange some of the graphs. And you, we have no way of tracking this. So we don't even know whether everyone is training on the same data. And I think this is a problem for us and we need to be aware of this and we need to fix this. So the point, again, I want to make this is not to put blame on the PyTorch Geometric uh, team. They are they're doing an excellent job. I think what we should avoid is, is this XKCD comic here, which tells us, is this really the state of our infrastructure? So we have all modern digital infrastructure and then we have this very interesting part there, which is a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. So this is, for those of you that are doing a lot of Node.js, and I'm really making enemies like a craftsman today, I would say, but for those of you that are used to the Node.js ecosystem, that's exactly what is happening there, right? You can just pull the plug there and then everyone then loses access to certain packages. So we should make sure that this is not the state of affairs in, in our house here. Again, I, I say this is somewhat controversial, but let's let's make sure that, that we don't end up there. Let's also make sure that we don't end up there. So let's make sure that graph learning doesn't end up in um, in the realm of of contributing to the to the reproducibility crisis. There is already there are already a lot of concerns concerning reproducibility in uh, with deep learning, not only with deep learning, with basically all the branches of uh, science. There's a great article on transparency and reproducibility in artificial intelligence that is targeted towards uh, medical AI models, but we should make sure that we don't end up um, heading in the in the same direction. Again, a slightly controversial point. I'm I'm aware of this, but I'd rather I'd rather raise this now and then try to fix it uh, with all of you together. Now. I've said a lot of, of bad things now, controversial things. So how can we actually improve the field? I think this is really, this is also really important. I Because I do have a couple of solutions. So first of all, what we can do is we can keep track of the provenance of data sets. That's actually something that is really, really good. And that actually also helps people that produce these data sets because you can put them on Zenodo, you can attach some information to that. And then you can even make sure that, um, that these data sets are being um, completely citable. We can use fingerprinting of data sets. We can use SHA-256 or something else. And I guess the, the crypto nerds will now come out and will tell me that this is a bad signature algorithm. I know, I know, but it's better than nothing, right? So we can use fingerprinting. We can make sure that we have versioning in place. We can make sure to inform users when the version has changed. We can version data sets themselves, right? So fingerprinting not only serves the versioning effort, but it also uh, tells us whether we have downloaded the right data set, but versioning is a, is a whole different beast. So it could very well be the case that at some point you decide that something needs to be updated and then it makes sense to have this available. There's also a great um, way of, of, uh, of detailing this type of prominence information, namely you, we could use data sheets to describe graph data sets. Now, I should say in the spirit of, of, of critiquing things, that I found the data sheets to be very, very hard to actually write down. So we did this for our hyperbart paper that I that I showed you briefly before. Um, check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, I found this a little bit too verbose to to fill out to fill out easily. And maybe for graphs, we might actually need some other questions there. So maybe it would be a good idea to develop new data sheets for for graphs and also for other uh, data sets in the future. The other thing that we can do is when we report results, we can take a look at how other fields are doing this. And I'm just um, just warming up to towards the end now, but just two, two more visualizations, I guess. So in, in time series classification and in data mining in general, they already follow this, this, uh, this idea of using benchmark data sets to a very strong extent. So I mean, I'm not sure whether their benchmark data sets are any better than ours. This is a whole different topic altogether. But what I really like is that you typically see that they're running comparisons on as many data sets as possible. And then they're comparing the methods always with the best available method. So we did something like this as well in one of our, one of our time series papers. It was really 
uh, it was a really bad plot or rather it, it would be playing live and research on hard mode because you're literally comparing to the specifically best method on one data set and you're comparing the performance of your method to that and essentially this uh, gives you a way to to split your space in, in two regions namely the region above the diagonal where your method is better than all the state-of-the-art methods or the lower diagonal where you're saying some method performs better in this region and then you can take a look at the accuracy difference for instance and and see what is actually going on what, what your trade-offs are these plots can be particularly useful i would say when you know that you have a kind of a competitive advantage um, over certain algorithms. So for instance, you could say, hey, look at these algorithms here. They have billions of parameters and we only have five, right? This is this is great. Then you can sort of make these plots and, and, and craft a comparison from them. So we can also do something else. And this, I think, is a great idea. Again, learning from the time series classification community in data mining, you can calculate these Texas sharpshooter plots using some well-established algorithm as a baseline. So these plots are really simple. You basically take one comparison partner. In our case, this could be a GNN or the, or the venerable GCN from a couple of years back, right? We could say, okay, we compare the performance of our cool new method with a GCN on the training data. And then we take the relative um, performance improvements or decreases as a kind of signal of what we would expect on the test or validation data set. And this is all you're, you're doing with these plots here. So, so the, the Texas sharpshooter plot, which is of course named after the, the fallacy of the same name, right? Compares the expected gains, so measured by comparing training performance with the actual gains. In this case, it's relative to a method called 1WN, uh, 1, 1 double DTWK and, and my goodness. Um, and this was described by, by Batista and colleagues. And basically what you want your method to be, you want to be in the true positive or in the true negative um, area always, because that tells you that performance on the training data tells you something about the test data and the relative improvements are kind of consistent. Again, very nice way of succinctly summarizing what is going on. Now, let's end on a good note. And I hope that, that not a lot of you jump ship now. So the problems that I'm mentioning here, and this is, I think, the good thing, these problems, they are less of a technological or I should say scientific nature. They are more of a social nature. And that is actually great news, I would say, because this means that we can fix them together. And I would love to get in discussion with you, figure out what you think about this, whether these are problems, whether they are not problems, whether you want to help, whether you know already people that are doing this. So I believe that we can fix them together and we can improve our community along the way and actually approach truth in, in a better fashion. With that, I'm at the end, and I want to thank lots of people there. So um, this is an amalgamation of lots of discussions that I had over the couple of years with uh, a lot of my co-authors, a, a lot of my collaborators, uh, a lot of my, well, uh, friends and colleagues, I should say. So um, they help shape these opinions. Nevertheless, if you have anyone to blame, then of course blame me, right? But thank you very much to, to all of them. And now I'm very happy to to take any questions you might have. Oh, thanks a lot, Bastian. That was a very inspiring talk. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to just post them in the chat. Um, I will lead with a slightly more lighthearted question. So yeah. you wrote the hyperboard paper in the style of a uh, play. Uh, what do you think are other literary styles that are underused by scientific publications? <laughs> Very good. I would say almost every style is underused. So um, I really like it when when people try out something something creative or something experimental. I know that you could puristically you could say it's all about transmitting information, and and I would agree. I mean, it should be also about that. But the form in which you present something can sometimes also be be fun. And I would say that having having, for instance, a little bit of poetry in there every once in a while that that could, for instance, be be a little bit fun. Um, I would also love to see, maybe that's something we can use chat GPT for. We could kind of rewrite an abstract or an introduction in the style of certain authors and then just see what, what fits most nicely, right? Like an Ernest Hemingway style introduction or something like this. Um, I have to admit I'm doing this because I because I sometimes, yeah, I like to have a little bit of fun when when doing these sort of things. Um, but of, of course it should not go towards readability, but in this case, it was just too good of an opportunity to miss, so. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, we should all be inspired to to be a bit more playful sometimes. Um, so one thing that that I found interesting was this um, 
uh, was it called graph world? Like this argument that, you know, like the actual graphs that exist only cover a, a subset and that maybe we should generate synthetic graphs that have other properties, right? I mean, I guess in practice that kind of begs the question to some extent, like if the real world only in the data sets that we look at brings about a certain set of graphs, and then our methods that we develop are inductively biased towards that kind of set of graphs, then maybe to some degree that's a good thing, right? Like that means we that's incorporate cool. this prior knowledge into our methods that the real world has a certain structure and that not all kinds of random potential graphs can actually arise, right? Like what's the, I guess, the trade-off here between actually evaluating benchmarking on a set of large graphs that, you know, like cover more space versus actually representing the real potential applications more closely. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very insightful, deep question. So um, maybe to put the tangent towards the towards what, what the computer vision people are doing, right? I mean, in computer vision, I feel, again, lots of hate mail coming in now, that the problem is maybe a little bit easier in the sense that you, that there it's pretty clear that out of all the images that you could generate with the camera, only a fraction, only a very small sub-manifold, in fact, I guess, is actually the the ones where you have real world images, so that are taken with um, with with real world structures uh, in mind. So, um, I think if we are really at the at the position already where we are inductively biasing our algorithms towards the all the graphs that exist in the real world and that are useful, then I think this would be a good thing. But um, I think the the graph world paper is raising also the question of what if this is not the case, right? So what if we are actually missing something and rather we are focusing more on towards pushing our biases towards the the, the benchmark data set that we have access to. And maybe we, sh we should rethink how these benchmark data sets were, were being created. So that ties a little bit, is, is a little bit tied in with, with, with my concept of the provenance information, right? If someone generates these graphs and they actually arise from some nice geometrical process, but then the generator of the graph decides that, okay, well, let's put additional information into the node features. Then I think we are already much more in the modeling decision than in the what what types of graphs do occur in the in the real world. I'm sorry, I'm not probably not making this this clear enough, but I guess my point would be um, it's the the difference between taking a picture with a camera and taking a picture with a camera and then photoshopping it such that the people don't don't have any any molds anymore or something like this right so it's basically like the question is how much how much of the how how many changes or uh, what level of change are you allowed to make until until you should say no no this is actually now a modeling decision that, does that make sense yeah no i think that's uh, that's a good distinction um so in the meantime we actually got a few questions on the chat which i'll oh, very nice. read out so please uh, keep them coming um so the first one is from uh, Sinead, and it's uh, maybe related to what you said but i'll, I'll read it out um, so she says she liked the example of how design choices can lead to different graphs in Romeo and Juliet. Um, but in real world graphs, um, there's typically a bigger problem of how we pick a subset of a graph. So in an applied graph, like a point cloud, it's reasonable to assume nodes are observed IID, but in many social networks, we're looking at ego graphs or random walk generated graphs. So the question is, to what extent do you feel our current methods are able to test their generalizability into unseen data? given that this depends so much on the data gathering mechanism. Mm -hmm. Also, wow, very, very insightful question. My goodness, and um, this is amazing. Um, so I personally believe that we don't really have good ways of generalizing because um, um, we don't really understand, we don't really understand the failure modes of, of GNNs well enough. I mean, they're, they're recently, no, a couple of years back, I think, sorry about that pandemic killed this. Okay. Um, so not as bad as you would expect. Um, so I think in this case, if you, if you actually are modeling a geometry to come back to this example and you, you have a random walk on that. Um, I' not even sure whether it's whether whether GNNs are the strongest way of 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 looking at this. And I think this might explain some of the generalization issues that we're seeing in the in the in the real world. In particular, for instance, with uh, um, with graph generative model evaluation or some or, or some of those aspects. Sorry, I'm not sure whether this 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 already answered the question. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, Sinead, if you have any any follow up questions, feel free to post. She says uh, thanks. Yeah, please, please, um, yeah, so, feel free to reach out. Yeah, there's another question by Yash who um, appreciates the fact that graphs have so many versions and that we need to handle that. So sometimes we have different versions of data, which might be original data, data with uh, not safe for work content removed, uh, data charts for retraining or federated learning, um, and so on. Um, so how do we handle so many different versions and versioning directions? Like, um, can, can this really realistically be handled and traced back? Or what are your thoughts on this? That's that's also a very very good aspect. So um so first of all, I believe that that um having different versions of a data set is act is is a really good thing, right? I don't want to um my my point should not be construed as saying no no we need to we need to have the best version or something like this, but rather we need to have a mechanism for understanding which version we are we are dealing with. Um the easiest thing would of course be if if we have um central uh, data repositories where we can publish and and kind of store these versions and then tag them accordingly, because then people can simply report the version that they've been training on in their paper, right? They could say, we have been training on the proteins data set, and it has a, a SHA-256 uh, of, I don't know, um, something, one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, so so this, this, can already be, this can already be helpful. And I think this would also help disentangle some of the, some of the claims. In particular, what we as researchers need to be aware of is um, if we change the data ourselves for our um which we sometimes might do right for some um as a pre-processing step or or as a um yeah, as, as a way to to just debug certain things in our um uh, in our papers then we also need to report this right we need to say that wait 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 in this table if you look at i don't know the column that has proteins data set in that it's not the original proteins data set it's our own version and we make it available here or something like this um I think so practically speaking, I'm not sure whether we can always pull this off. I mean, but there are repositories out there for handling data and uh, data and, and and versions, right? Like Zenodo, for instance, you can get a DOI for any version of your data set and people can literally even cite these these individual versions then. So at least thinking about this or experimenting with something like this could could already be be useful or or reporting the fingerprint of the data sets if people have have decided upon such a procedure. But that's not something that you and I can do, but that's something that we, maybe we need like a, like a community hall meeting for this and need to say, need to go to the people that are preparing the data sets and, and need to say, hey, please, please add this type of information. Um, and then, then we try to report it more, more consciously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I guess we can start by being a good example. And uh, I'm sure you do this, right? Like to put your data on Zenodo and then say like, this is my version of the data set. Exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. What I what I really liked about the talk was there's a lot of stuff that's you know quite transferable outside of graph learning, right? Like a lot of things about how to handle your baselines and how to do honest ablations and stuff. Um, so, do you personally feel like within the sub community of of graph learning um, that that's being handled um, better or worse or the same as in the you know wider range of of machine learning? Yeah, so honestly, there I have something very good to report. I have the feeling that it's actually being handled uh, better, at least at least since the advent of of these bigger um, graph learning uh, um, benchmarks. So um, there was a there was a time a couple of years ago where people were training on these very small data sets, myself included, right? I'm not an exception here. And then you really had to slug through the paper and you had to see, okay, are they using the right um, uh, the right ways of of cross validating and so on. Um, now with the bigger data sets and even with some some of them actually have predefined splits, it, actually it has become a lot nicer to to read these things. So that these these um, the OGB data set, for instance, this is really a, a godsend um, in 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 that in that regard. Um, so I would say from my limited view or vantage point where I'm, I'm dabbling in a couple of other parts of, of machine learning as well, but I would say that graph learning is not, not, not at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to, to working um, uh, and, and, and being aware of these aspects. But there's still a lot, a lot to improve, honestly, uh, but also in the greater machine learning world, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um... Yeah, so maybe that's a, that's a nice, hopeful message to to end on. Uh, we don't have any other questions right now, so um, I'd like to thank you again, Bastian, for for joining us and everyone else for joining this talk. Um, as Manuel has posted in the chat, you can sign up to our mailing list to stay up to date with future talks. You can also suggest interesting speakers you would like to see 
Um, and you can always visit our website for further updates. So with that, uh, thank you, Bastian, and thank you, everyone else. Thank you very much for having me.